Is it'll all get worse. It does mean there's potential seeding outside of Avalon and outside of the northern beaches. Also ahead, holiday plans are thrown into chaos as other states and territories talk of quarantine and border closures over the Christmas break. Good evening, I'm Jeremy Fernandez. This is ABC News. A boost for aged care. Responsibility for the sector is elevated to the top levels of the federal government. Was it part first? Given! That was the plan, that was the setup. And Australia's openers fall early in the first test. Well, tonight it's not just Sydney on edge, but the entire country. The Northern Beaches cluster has grown by 10 infections to 28 overnight. And there are alerts for venues across the city as far as the central coast, Cronulla, the North Shore, eastern suburbs and inner west. Health authorities are racing to slow the spread of the virus and they're pleading with Sydney siders to take it seriously. If that fails, Gladys Berejiklian is warning that restrictions could be back within days. Thousands of people have had their Christmas holiday plans ruined because other states are tightening border restrictions to protect themselves. We have reporters across Sydney tonight, but first let's go to Ursula Malone at the Avalon Bowling Club. Ursula. Well, as you mentioned, Jeremy, 10 new cases were announced this morning. That brought the total in this cluster to 28. But we are hearing tonight of a rising number of new cases. And there's real concern that this cluster has spread far beyond the northern beaches. In fact, we've just had confirmation of a case on the central coast, and that case has been linked to this cluster here on the northern beaches. So um, with, earlier this, uh, this evening, the health authorities have issued an urgent call for people to come forward for testing, and a statewide call for people to come forward for testing, even if they have the mildest symptoms. And this afternoon, there was a health advisory, a strong health advisory for people here on the northern beaches to wear a mask at all time in indoor venues, such as at supermarkets or on trains and buses. Panic buying is back. People are stocking up and preparing for the worst. If they do lock it down, it will be will be a bit devo for the um, for the kids. Authorities are appealing for residents on the northern beaches to stay at home this weekend to slow the spread of the virus. Manly's famous Corso was deserted. Along the beaches, the red and yellow flags have been lowered. The lifeguards sent home for their own safety. I think there's a mixture of feelings. It's like, oh, why us? And uh, and they're annoyed. Um, people in the sort of Avalon, Palm Beach area um, are a bit nervous and a bit anxious. Thousands of residents have been asked to get tested, regardless of whether they have symptoms or have visited affected venues. My husband waited four hours yesterday at Mona Vale Hospital. I waited two hours here last night and, and then gave up. So far, contact tracing has not turned up the answers authorities had hoped for. My anxiety is that we haven't found the direct transmission route and can't be ensured that we've blocked every transmission line. Genome testing has shown the strain has come from the United States. Health officials say it's similar to that seen in a traveller who arrived from the US on December the 1st. The spotlight has also turned to airline crews and even visitors with special exemptions. There has been speculation that uh, this latest outbreak has been sparked by a, a celebrity brought in for a film shoot. Is there any, any truth to that speculation that, that you're aware of? Uh, look, I apologise, I don't have any information on that. What now has authorities concerned is the discovery that infected cases visited venues 70 kilometres south in Cronulla and 90 kilometres west in Penrith. It does mean there's potential seeding outside of Avalon and outside of the northern beaches. That sparked fears that in the lead up to Christmas, Sydney could be sliding towards a Melbourne style lockdown. If we get on top of this in the next two or three days, all of us will be able to have a much better Christmas. But if we don't get on top of it in the next few days, it could mean further restrictions down the track. Residents right across Sydney are being urged to take extra precautions or see Christmas plans turned into disarray. 
Ursula Malone, ABC News, Sydney. And Rani Heyman's outside one of the many testing clinics in Avalon where there have been, again, some long lines, long waits. Rani, how's it looking there tonight? That's right, Jeremy. So I'm here at the Avalon Recreation Centre, where, as you can see behind me, there is quite a long line. And as would be expected, the mood is quite bleak. People here have shared feelings of frustration, disappointment, anger and sadness at cancelled Christmas plans uh, in the week to come. I spoke to one woman who said she was meant to fly to Melbourne to see family there, but two of her children are now in isolation. So those plans are no longer happening. And that was really a reoccurring theme here as I spoke to people but what we do know is that these people here have said that this is the only thing that they can do to take any kind of control of what's going on in Sydney at the moment coming and getting tested is the right thing to do and that's what they're here to do. Ronnie Heyman in Avalon. Well there are dozens of venues caught up in this Northern Beaches cluster and that list is growing and extending across the metro area. Tonight there are fresh warnings issued for cafes, restaurants, change rooms, RSL clubs, shops and supermarkets where the virus has been circulating during the past week. Some of the latest additions are Woolworths in Avalon and Mona Vale, Aldi in Mona Vale, the Commonwealth Bank at Avalon Beach plus the local Avalon Beach Surf Life Saving Club post office and the Palm Beach Pool and Rock Pool. There's also a growing list of places of concern across the metro area, including Westfield at Bondi Junction. For anyone who was there on Tuesday this week, you'll find the full list and definitive advice on the New South Wales Health website with the dates and times of concern. Well, while New South Wales is confident it can contain the outbreak, some states aren't taking any chances. Travellers desperate to reconnect with family and friends are navigating a myriad of border restrictions. Many have brought their flights forward in the hope they won't be forced to spend Christmas in quarantine. After nine months of near empty airports, today anything but. And as soon as you walk in you do feel a bit of, bit of anxiety. A feeling shared by many fearing snap border closures. We were supposed to be flying to Tasmania next Sunday um, but we were worried that we wouldn't be able to get there so we just brought it forward and got the first thing we could. Oh, my mum's gone to my sister's for Christmas, she was supposed to fly out at 11 tomorrow. So we had to pay an exorbitant amount of money to get a flight today. These Victorians have just landed. They're now considering a 180. We can't really afford two-week hotel quarantine or we still don't know. That's the thing, we don't know what's going to happen. We were planning to head to Mackay in North Queensland on Christmas Eve. Kelly Borg hasn't seen her mum in two years. She'll have to wait even longer. We were really excited about going um, for Christmas and she was pretty excited. Um, so it's pretty, pretty sad news to wake up to this morning. As the cluster grows, so too anxiety interstate. We want to keep our Queenslanders safe. Victorians have worked really hard. We must do whatever is required to keep us safe. Victoria's introducing a traffic light system. Upon entry, people from regional New South Wales will be told to monitor for symptoms. All Sydney siders must be tested and isolate until they get their results. But those who've been on the northern beaches won't be allowed in at all. They're also banned from travelling to the Apple Isle. Queensland, South Australia and the Northern Territory will force people who've been in the hotspot to quarantine in a hotel for two weeks. Western Australia is making everyone from every part of New South Wales self-isolate at home for a fortnight, while the nation's capital is only asking those who've been on the northern beaches to do the same. I'm going. If I get on that plane and they, and they say it's not happening, I just want to come back. I don't want to be stuck there for two weeks in quarantine. As if travelling wasn't stressful enough. Tim Swanston, ABC News, Sydney. And Tim Swanson is at Sydney Airport for us tonight. Tim, it's been one of the busiest days of the year. Jeremy, the last Friday before Christmas was always going to be busy, but we know that since the border announcements last night and this morning that flights with cheap airfares out of New South Wales sold out very quickly. Qantas today said that it experienced a very high volume of requests from travellers in Sydney who are looking to change their travel plans. Now, on the borders, states and territories will be applying a very serious amount of scrutiny to the New South Wales health response. They've also flagged that they could enforce stricter border measures should that uh, northern beaches cluster expand geographically or grow in size. Tim Swanson at Sydney Airport.
Well, one of the chinks in Australia's armour during the pandemic is international air crew. More than a dozen South American crew members have been fined for breaching self-isolation orders in Sydney. New South Wales is tightening the rules, so pilots and cabin crew must stay in heavily guarded hotels during their layovers. The race is on to find patient zero, but they may have already left the country. Up to 3,000 international crew fly into Sydney every week, some from the world's worst COVID hotspots. So far, the crews have been told to isolate in their hotels, but they're not guarded by police, and some staff are breaking the rules. It's the breach of the guidelines that's the problem. It's not the actual guidelines themselves, it's people unfortunately doing the wrong thing. A LATAM crew was busted doing just that three weeks ago. The 13 South American crew members were supposed to stay in their hotel rooms at Mascot, but instead they visited nearby venues. Each has been fined $1,000. While the breach isn't believed to be responsible for any local cases, the Premier fears it could have been disastrous. It's about us shutting the door on every risk factor that we can see and that's why from Tuesday the system will not only rely on people's goodwill and compliance, but it will literally be policed. I think this is uh, an important step, it's uh, a balanced step. The Health Minister is yet to confirm what rules might change for Australian based pilots and cabin crew who are allowed to self-isolate at home when they return from overseas. One of the issues that we're looking at is uh, um, possibly requiring them to be tested before they go to their home. It's um, been a long eight months for our cabin crew and what they've had to put up with. A decision is expected in the coming days. James Carmody, ABC News, Sydney. And for the latest on the outbreak, you can keep up to date on the ABC News website and ABC News channel. Police are treating the double murder of an elderly couple in Brisbane as an act of terrorism. The only suspect is dead, shot by police on the Logan motorway during a confrontation yesterday morning. The man's father denies his son had terrorist links, but says he needed help. A sombre procession in the midst of a shocking suburban tragedy. Zoe and Morris Antill were both in their mid-80s and yesterday were found murdered in their home on Brisbane's south side. We are treating this matter as a terrorism event. The suspect, 22-year-old Raggy Abdi. Dashcam footage captured his final moments Thursday morning. He was fatally shot by police after officers say he threatened them with a knife on the Logan motorway. His link to the elderly couple and alleged motive isn't known. Until we can establish a, a connection, then yes, we would uh, look at it as a random. Abdi had previously been the subject of a counter-terrorism investigation. He was arrested last year at the Brisbane airport. The information that was available to us was he was intending to travel to Somalia to, to seek to join and fight with um, Al-Shabaab. He wasn't charged but was on bail for other minor offences. Police say he cut off his GPS tracking device on Wednesday. Detectives are now trying to piece together what happened in the hours that followed. Linking the deaths of this elderly couple to terrorism is premature, especially in absence of any solid evidence in public domain. Police have been door knocking homes around the neighbourhood. If you have family living in that Parkinson area, it would be a good time to check in on them and make sure that they're OK. Residents in this quiet suburban street say they feel shocked and uneasy by what's unfolded here. They've described the Antools as a beautiful, innocent couple and much-loved neighbours. Mohammed Abdi says his son was going through an identity and mental health crisis but didn't have terrorist links. My son needed help when he was there and the help he got was to get shot. Police say there's no ongoing threat to the community. Lily Knopfling, ABC News, Brisbane. The Prime Minister has announced a small but important ministerial reshuffle, elevating aged care into Cabinet and giving Dan Tian the job of repairing trade relations with China. Scott Morrison has put the emphasis on stability in the midst of a recession recovery and a health crisis that's far from over. Here's political reporter Jane Norman. High hopes of a COVID-free Christmas Australia. derailed. Uh, we've dealt with this before, we'll deal with it again. Fresh outbreaks reminding us all that this pandemic isn't over. In a time of great uncertainty, 
Stability and consistency is very much what is needed. Unveiling his third ministry, Scott Morrison's opted for a minimal reshuffle, triggered by the retirement of Matthias Cormann. I won't be back. <laughs> With Simon Birmingham already in the key finance portfolio, Dan Tian steps up into trade. A former diplomat, he'll need to draw on those skills and more to repair Australia's fraught relationship with China. Fellow Victorian Alan Tudge replaces him in education. Helping younger Australians navigate challenges in a rapidly changing world. Ahead of the release of the Aged Care Royal Commission's final report, the Prime Minister's elevated the portfolio into Cabinet. Health Minister Greg Hunt will take on the extra role. Richard Colbeck remains in the Ministry but with reduced responsibilities. How many residents of aged care facilities have passed away from COVID-19? I'll just have to look up my latest report, Chair. The Minister copped money. criticism for his handling of aged care during the COVID crisis, but his leader denies it's a demotion. This is about more focus on aged care, not less, and that's all it's about. Assistant Ministers Jane Hume and Zedsa Selger have been promoted, while two new faces join the Outer Ministry, Andrew Hastie and Amanda Stoker. So the team the Prime Minister presents to the Governor-General next week will be almost identical to the one sworn in after Scott Morrison's miracle win last year. Putting a premium on stability, save for a shock resignation or retirement, it's likely this will be the ministry he takes to the next election. Before then, he's planning on taking some time off in January with his family, this time promising to tell us when. Can I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas? The new year can't come soon enough. Jane Norman, ABC News, Canberra. Tropical cyclone Yasa has killed at least two people in Fiji, including a three-month-old baby. The cyclone was in the highest category, five, when it hit land last night. Fijian authorities say thousands of people are still in evacuation centres and it's estimated the damage bill will run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. In this home in Savu Savu, six families sheltered together, singing to keep their spirits up as the storm raged outside. Elsewhere, thousands gathered in evacuation centres as Cyclone Yasa made landfall in Fiji. The weather changed. There was heavy rain and uh, the wind started to get stronger. And uh, that's when the house started to felt shaky. That's when Sateri Wing took her four children to a nearby evacuation centre. I was afraid for my kids eh? in terms of uh, safety. More than 93,000 Fijians found themselves in the direct path of the storm. I can confirm as of this morning we now have two fatal deaths. A three-month-old baby and a 45-year-old man have been killed and there are warnings the number of deaths will likely rise. The Category 5 cyclone brought winds of up to 345 kilometres per hour as it tore through Fiji's second biggest island, Vanua Levu. It's now been downgraded to a Category 3 cyclone as it heads towards Tonga. Fiji's Prime Minister has blamed climate change for an increase in storm severity in the region. He says recovery efforts are already starting. Clearing roads, restoring critical infrastructure and services, re-establishing communications with severely affected areas and coordinating support from our development partners. But reaching the people most in need may take some time. If you are impacted, help is on the way. Rest assured, we will reach you with relief. Hundreds of buildings have been destroyed, but the full extent of the damage likely won't be known for days. Natalie Whiting, ABC News. Authorities are warning of a new scam targeting social media users nationwide where images and information are stolen and used to promote fake porn websites. Cybersecurity experts say they're fielding calls from victims every day. Earlier this year, Jessica Laurie was horrified to discover her Instagram page had been cloned. The fake account promoting a website offering explicit content for a fee. I just instantly felt sick. These are my photos and my family and my information. It had stories on it, um, very graphic 
you know, images with things blotted out. Dental student Stacey Madden faced a similar ordeal. A fake account using her details had already attracted more than 150 followers. One of my major concerns, um, probably being able to um, find a job after this if it was to escalate. Everyone judging or thinking that it actually is me um, when, it, when it wasn't. They followed all my friends and all my family. This account that looked exactly like me but with OnlyFans had just suddenly popped up and started following them. Start here and then I'll Experts warn the scam is targeting victims nationwide. One common methodology is, uh, I guess, baiting or um, you know, having an image there that people want to click on, uh, take them to a website that might be malicious so that the criminals can harvest their information. Even when reported, getting the accounts taken down can be arduous. It, it would be weeks or months in between where someone would send me it. It got exhausting because over time I was like, oh, not again, it's not taken down. It's not uncommon for us to have people say that they've actually reported abuse over 100 times and are still waiting for action to be taken. I think there's a question to ask the social media companies as to how, how they can better improve. When contacted by the ABC, an Instagram spokesperson said the platform had a specialised team dedicated to finding and blocking impersonation scams. It says it works to remove accounts that violates its rules when found or reported to them. Police are urging victims to report the scams to local stations. The unauthorised use of somebody's personal identification information and image is a criminal offence. But experts warn a frustrating 99% of cybercrime remains unsolved. So in terms of deterrence for the perpetrator, there's little deterrence at the moment. Tara Cassidy, ABC News. After an extraordinary school year, Year 12 students today received their final results. Many woke up to their HSC scores, which were delivered via text message at 6am. The moment of truth after a year like no other. Very, I'm very nervous, actually. Surrounded by his mates, Hamza Khan checked his ATAR result at his work's end-of-year party. I think That's it's all right. Hey, yeah. not a no, no, not a mystery no. Yeah. Yeah. He's relief, and I think that all my burden that was on my shoulders and my heart, I think it's gone, so obviously I feel great and, like, I feel very light at the moment. The 17-year-old wants to study oral health at Sydney University. Hamza arrived in Australia as a refugee six years ago with only a little English. It's very significant for me and my family because in Pakistan, when I was in Pakistan, we were kind of deprived from education, so I think it's very good that me and my family are here to access tertiary education and high school education. 18-year-old <laughs> Amy Ridley is one of a record number of students to receive an early offer into uni. She'll be studying law and psychology at Macquarie University. They're written nuts. <laughs> it was super crazy doing the HSC this year, just because of everything that happened. Like, we just had to keep rolling with each punch that was fired at us. She's happy to be putting 2020 behind her and hopes the pandemic won't stop her making new friends at uni. It's a new opportunity to find new people and that's pretty much my main goal. Oh, this group of Newcastle students came together one last time to celebrate their results. It was like a roller coaster. You have ups and obviously downs with pandemic, but um, I think it made the relief of getting the ATAR. I think it was more sweeter in the end because of what we had to go through. 55,000 students received an ATAR this year, and despite the challenges brought on by the pandemic, the median result, 70.15, was actually slightly higher than in 2019. Class of 2020, I think you guys can just keep your heads up and we did it through COVID, so obviously we can do anything. How do you do that? And now the hard work's out of the way, it's time to celebrate. Kathleen Calderwood, ABC News. To finance and the COVID outbreak in Sydney has led to a sell-off on the share market. Here's Elise Morgan. The cluster in Sydney's northern beaches really knocked market sentiment today. The banks bore the brunt and some bad company news highlights the fact that COVID challenges are not behind us. A2 Milk, once a market darling, was whacked after it downgraded earnings expectations. The lack of Chinese tourists and students sending baby milk back home has not been good for business. And QBE was savaged after the insurer warned of a $2 billion loss coming, which given the year shouldn't be that surprising to investors. So falling confidence saw the All Lords drop 1.1% today. It begs the question, are we too confident? 
The weekly reading from ANZ and Roy Morgan is at a 13-month high, meaning we're more confident now than we were before COVID was a thing. The Westpac Monthly Confidence Series is also peaking, but it more clearly shows the effect that a virus outbreak here and subsequent lockdowns can have. So, as the health ministers are saying, it's no time for complacency. But compare our data to a country which is certainly not on top of the virus. The United States consumer confidence is dropping rapidly, not helped overnight by another rise in jobless claims, indicating the US recovery is stalling. But the US market rose because we're back in the bad news is good news for market cycle. No jobs should equal more stimulus, which will push the US dollar down and the Aussie up. It hit 76.4 US overnight. That's a two year high, with many saying it's only the beginning. That's finance. India's bowlers have hit back against Australia, leaving the first test of the Adelaide Oval evenly poised on day two. The tourists were rocked by the new ball last night and then collapsed dismally when play resumed. Under the lights on the big stage, the leading man was left speechless when Ajinka Rahane stumbled over his lines. Oh, with skipper Virat Kohli on his way, the new ball delivered Australia further success as India went to stumps at 6 for 233. Yeah. Oh, some shape. Hazelwood, he's got him! It's nice to see you move a little bit tonight and hopefully we can get it moving one way or the other tomorrow, tomorrow early afternoon and, and uh, get a few more wickets. Those wickets came in a procession as India's tail offered precious little resistance. The tourists lost 4 for 11 in just 25 deliveries to be all out for 244. All straight up in the air. Australia's new opening combination bounced onto the field but was slow out of the blocks, taking almost five overs to break the duck. Signs of aggression. But there were soon bad signs for Australia. Matthew Wade trapped in front with Joe Burns following in similar fashion. That was the plan, that was the setup. The setup for Manus Labuschagne worked perfectly as well, except for the dropped catch as Australia limped to the break at 2 for 35. He offered another chance early in the second session, and again the Indians failed to capitalise. They finally pouched a Steve Smith offering, though. Australia vulnerable with still a night session to negotiate. Neil Cross, ABC News, Adelaide. Let's take a look at the weather now. It's been another sultry day across the state, Graham. Yeah, it has, Jeremy. In fact, we've got a thunderstorm at the moment pushing across Avalon in the far northeast of Sydney. It's been very warm and humid. Our tops range from 30 to 34. That was ahead of this afternoon's southerly wind change. And severe thunderstorms developed across much of the northeast. Areas of hail, damaging wind, and heavy rain. Gust recorded at 100 kilometres per hour at Scone, 98 at Gunnedah, and 90 at Walgett. 70 millimetres of rain at Red Oak, north of Taree. Gunnedah recorded 41 and 42 at Nabiak. And a southerly change is moving across the central inland plains of the southern half of the coast today. And it's going to push the humid air mass northeast, but showers and storms will continue in the northeast with a lingering humid air mass. And the showers will tend to rain areas about the northeast from Monday to Wednesday, some locally moderate falls. That's ahead of more stable conditions late in the week. And we've got flood watches and severe weather warnings current for parts of the Northern Territory in WA as a low develops within the monsoon trough and that's going to bring some strong winds and heavy rain. The showers for us will be far more likely and widespread across the northeast, with heavier totals about the northern slopes and the northern tablelands. So into the northeast, showers and storms across the tablelands, possibly severe, a possible shower or thunderstorm elsewhere, but they should generally clear from the Hunter early morning. And strong winds on the waters will ease on Hunter waters in the morning as well. A fairly cloudy but generally dry day for the most part. Any isolated thunderstorms or showers are really a little bit more likely in the afternoon or evening. And strong winds on the waters, but they should also ease mostly by morning. Now, showers and thunderstorms likely severe on the slopes and also the nearby plains, that's the northwest slopes and plains, generally dry and sunny conditions elsewhere. 
We've got strong southerly winds easing on the waters by dawn. Our lows will range from 15 to 19 and our tops will reach 21 to 23. It'll be a mostly cloudy day, just a possible isolated light area of showers or morning drizzle. So uh, generally dry through the afternoon. Sunday mostly dry once again, but as we hit Monday, another trough will move in. This is going to bring another burst of widespread showers, but it does start to ease off as we head into Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, Jeremy. Graham, thank you. That's the latest ABC News. Thanks for your company. Next on ABC and iView, join Costa and the team for a cheery Christmas special on the season final of Garden.